welcome to another uh, session of Virtual Global Spine Conference. Um, I'm excited to be here today with uh, some of our uh, co-hosts and panelists, Dr. Mamagani and Rasuli, as uh, well, we will be, uh, I'm sure, welcoming others. Thank you to uh, all the participants that are uh, starting to come in. Uh, this week, uh, we are uh, veering off a little bit from the usual cases and whatnot, and along the, the theme of recent topics on leadership, education, and training, we thought it would be a great idea to tackle the subject, the very important subject of enabling spine technologies and its impact on uh, training uh, and education, specifically for residents and fellows. Um, th there is no question that this is a very hot topic um, that is discussed and debated on basically a daily basis in a lot of the uh, operating rooms and, and medical centers in terms of how much or how little should trainees be exposed to it. Uh, should they learn how to do uh, anatomic freehand techniques before they use CT guided navigation or robotics? Should cases be canceled if uh, you know, the, the, nav, the navigation system or the robot isn't working. Just really a lot of big topics, but uh, we're going to focus specifically on, uh, on the impact on resident training. And of course, uh, there's probably really, in my opinion, no better person to discuss the, this than our good friend, Dr. Mauricio Avila. Uh, Mauricio is a long-term, uh, long-time friend and colleague. He is a senior resident currently at the uh, Department of Neurosurgery in our sister campus at the University of Arizona in Tucson. And uh, very soon, I think in the next few weeks, he will be heading up to Seattle to complete a one-year uh, clinical spine fellowship. Uh, he not only is an outstanding neurosurgical resident, but he also uh, has a uh, focused interest on education, of course, receiving uh, a master's in medical education from the Netherlands not too long ago. And so he definitely has a bright future in, in, in academics and, and in training. And of course, he is a budding spine surgeon. So we already like him just for that reason alone. Um, and it's absolutely great to have him. So Mauricio, welcome. Thank you for joining us uh, today. And we're excited to, uh, to hear what you, uh, what you have to say on this topic. Well, thank you, Dr. Baj, and all the faculty from the virtual uh, spine conference for letting me speak. I'm going to share my slides. Um, and as usual with virtual spine, please feel free to, you know, interrupt and ask questions and everything. Um, I'm basically going to do this in two parts. The first part is just a very broad overview of enabling technologies. I know we have, you know, seasoned spine surgeons on, on the call, but also some medical students and different levels of training. So just very kind of broad overview of of three type of enabling technologies. And then we're gonna to go to actual, the actual impact and the data that is out there for, for spine training. Uh, no disclosures, no financial disclosures. We will talk about some unpublished data and of course my opinions and I think other opinions that I've heard from other <laughs> surgeons. And personally, I do enjoy trying and using new technologies. So those are basically my, my disclosures. As Dr. Baj was saying, and on the theme of global spine, so I was actually born in Chile, raised in Colombia, then lived in Belgium, did my medical school in Colombia, my master's degree in the Netherlands, and I'm finishing my, my residency um, in, in, in the US. So, you know, I think, I think it's suitable for the, the theme of global, global spine conference. So as we all know, the technology continues to advance in general in our world. And of course, within spine surgery, there's no different. Um, the last 20 years within our field, the expansion of, of new technologies has been pretty massive. And, and as, as we as surgeons collaborate with the companies, the engineers, we continue to expand our tools you know, every year, not every month. Um, this is also coupled with our better understanding of, of, of the actual surgeries that we do and, and the outcomes and how they work. Plus, then we're adding on that technology to that as well. Just you know, a 20 second slide saying, all in all, spine surgery is very new. And in particular within neurosurgery, I'm, I'm a neurosurgery resident, so you know, there's, there's that bias. Um, you know, the first cervical discectomies were recorded in the 1950s, the first lumbar fusion in the 70s, and more 
minimal invasive surgeries in the in the late 90s to early 2000s. So we're talking about a very new field in general within within all the surgical subspecialties. Plus now we have all the new technology that's coming. What we found so far, right? We have good procedures with good outcomes, right? They're you know replicable, reliable. They do provide benefits for our patients. So then the question is, you know, how is this evolving? So I really like this graph, right? And this is in, in pounds, but I think we all at some point, at least I, and I'm a, I'm a millennial, but I still use floppy disks. And as we know, just in the past five to 10 years, everything is going smaller and smaller and smaller in size. But at the same time, the um, it is going bigger in storage, right? So we used to, let's say for just a Word document, you need three floppy disks. Now you have a micro SD that can fit thousands of those. So I think there's a parallel within the evolution of spine surgery, right? From the early open to endoscopic, to tubular, to lateral axis, everything is evolving. And as you can see, just from the timeline, just in the past 20 years, there's a big evolution within our techniques. And of course now within our technology. Just a quick definition of enabling technologies. Enabling technology is an invention or a new innovation that can be applied to drive radical change and the capabilities of our use of a culture. So other examples of enabling technology in our world is the printing press, the light bulb, refrigeration, computers, and of course the internet. So it's not it's not a small word using enabling technology in spine. So we, you know, those of us who use that type of word, we're saying this is a revolution, right? This is a big change within sponsoring. Why is this important? Another graph that I really like, this was published in the, in the 60s. So this is the adoption of a new technology. This is general, not necessarily related to spine surgery or any, or any type of technology. So there's only gonna be a small minority of innovators, then a still minority of early adopters, then every, you know, most people get in, but then there's also gonna be people who's gonna be lagging behind. So where are we now? This is just specifically for robotics. We're in those between the early adopters to kind of go into the early majority. So we're in this, you know, the authors call it the, the, the chasm. Yeah. We're, we're in this transition period between those who are early adopters who are now getting a majority of this, of this new technology out there. As I was saying, this is the inflection point. So this is where the key opinion leaders, the people who look after in spine surgery, as they start using this, then everybody else will catch on. So there are the early adopters, and then they're going to try to show us that it is useful. Then the majority will, will get it. And of course, as, as surgeons, you want to be on the left-hand side of the delta, right? You don't want to be those, you know, late adopters or, you know, people lagging behind with this new technology. Uh, especially in a field that is as competitive as, as spine surgery. So I'm just going to briefly talk about this, these three technologies, spinal navigation, robotics, and augmented and virtual reality. There are traditional methods work, right? The things we've been doing since the 50s and 70s work. The question is, how can we make them better? How can we improve? How we get less soft tissue disruption? How we can make them replicable, reliable, predictive, and potentially faster, right? We have a very good method, how we can make it better. Um, and I use here traditional, that's why I put it um, in between kind of brackets. So I'm talking about our traditional freehand pedicle screw technique, for example, or just uh, floor assisted, x-ray assisted. That's what I will gonna refer from now on in, in the presentation as a traditional type of method. Um, as you can see, this is a thoracic spine fully exposed and doing a, a free hand with a with a with a lengthy probe, a pedicle probe through the through the pedicle. Then navigation, especially for us in neurosurgery, I think it was very easy. I, I can tell you from, from a personal perspective, you know, I started doing the navigation with the brain tumors, and then as, as I was getting more senior and getting the, the bigger spine cases, doing spinal navigation it wasn't hard because we're used to the navigation part of it. It's just changing where we put the, the, the arrays, the frame, and where we put the, the camera and all that stuff. So it was very easy, I think, in general neurosurgery for 
transition from a cranial navigation to a spinal navigation. We're already used to it. As, as most of us know, it's, it's based most of the time on CT. Um, it's easier because the bone, quote unquote, is fixed. It's not going to move. It's not like a soft tissue. Um, so it's easier to use that as a reference. Um, the patient will need a, a reference frame, the instruments we need reference, markers, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going from this traditional method, you know, open anatomical monomarks to this navigated method where we can do smaller incisions and then achieve the same outcome in putting, let's say, a pedicle screen. So a little a busy slide, but I just want to show some data. So the most of the data I will show is based on pedicle screw accuracy because it's the one that has the objective number, so it's easier to compare. Um, so here in this graph, you can see just conventional fluoroscopy on the left. Decent percentages of accuracy, but you can see the range is quite wide. And then this 3D spinal navigation, even higher of a mean of accuracy and a smaller range. For example, just in the thoracic spine, you can see there's a big change. There's a big change from just the conventional fluoroscopy, or let's say even freehand, versus using navigation. Thinking about insertional time, right? We want to make our procedures faster. So you can see that navigation actually makes the procedure uh, insertion of this group faster. And again, this is a pool of several studies. This is a, this was published in about 2015, but you can see from 94.3 to all the way to 97% of accuracy of pedicle screw insertion. So this is actually pretty good, right? It, it is a good technology for pedicle screw accuracy. Now robotics, um, you know, we're all, I think most of us initially heard about robotics thinking about the Da Vinci, right? And this is how the Da Vinci looks like. There's a, like a console where the surgeon sits and then somebody helps them move the arms, but then the surgeon is looking, this is their view here in the, in the console and then they're moving their hands and moving the robotic arms. Um, it's been around, you know, about 22 years since the FDA was approved. Um, now some of the, the general surgery the specialties do have a fellowship on that, which will be relevant when we talk about the impact of training. And of course, as you know, the general surgeons, the gynecologists are using this, we as spine surgeons do not you know, fall behind. So we also develop our own robotic systems. But it doesn't look like this, right? This is, I don't know if you, if you remember, this was a big thing on, on, on the news and social media. They did a surgery on a grape, um, but ours is not like that. So this is going to be a short video. So you can play. But anyway, this is how it looks. So it is the robotic arm that moves to a preset position. And then again, I have no complex. This is just you know one of the robotics arms available. And then you can insert the pedicle screw through a fixed arm that travels to that position. So that's the most common use currently with the robotic arm in, in spine surgery. Now, as I was mentioning, the first one for spine was approved in 2004 but it, it, did, it didn't went well. It was slow, the accuracy wasn't that good. But as you can see, just from this last basically 10 years, and this is all the surgical robotic system, so it's not just spine, there's been at least 10 years. And, and I think within spine, starting 2016, there was a major kind of inflection point and then just started with one and now there's three, at least as far as I know, three different companies that have robotic arms, there's probably a fourth that's gonna try to have it. So, we're still in the very early ages of having several robotic arms and the adoption as well. But again, what let's look at the data. As I mentioned, the pedicle screw accuracy placement is one of the objective measures that is easy to compare. So in robotics, you have several reports from as low as, let's say, 95% to as high as 98%. Um, I think more, more importantly for us, a surgeon is the times you have to take back a patient for a revision. So this is the post-op revision. So this one on this newer version, 0%. On the older version, 0.2%. So that's those are excellent numbers to not have to take back a patient to revise the screw that's misplaced. And the third one, before we go into the impacts of the training, is the augmented and virtual reality. So for this lady, the younger crew, or maybe some of the older crew, um, this is like Pokemon Go, so you have the street, but then you put your phone and then Pikachu appears and then you can send this. So that's when people think about augmented reality. That's the, let's say, the lay person. For us, it's not the same. It's also not the, the metaverse, right? We're not 
hidden mercy in there yet. Um, but it looks something like this. So the, again, this is one of the companies, this is one of the pet sets. Uh, and then this is how it looks like. So you as a surgeon put the headset on and then you have a view, and as you can see, this is a training model, but you have a view of your navigation, your navigation tools. And at the same time, you have a view of the spine and how your tools are traveling. So it's a very hot topic as we're talking about at the beginning. Uh, as you can see, just in, in research, of course, robotics is still getting the majority, but augmented reality and spine surgery is getting more and more interest. Um, and I think to me, this is a key in, in the augmented reality work is even with robotics, you still, what I call, you know, kind of looking away, going back and forth between the patient's spine where you're operating to the screen, to the robotic arm, versus if you have the headset, you're basically just looking down where you're operating at the spine and you have all the information. So that's quite appealing from, a, let's say, ergonomics and workflow as well. Uh, for, for instrumentation. Um, this is a, a recent recent um, systematic review that we did. Um, most of the data we, we ended up on 2021. I know there's been a couple of papers since, but as you can see, very few patients, mostly case series. There's no randomized control trial yet. Um, few hospitals that have the technology have published their data. Um, they do have... Um, Good data overall, you know, some reported 45% of middle breach, however, no revision. Data. So as as the preliminary clinical data comes out, it looks like it is a very also a very good platform. But of course, you know, there's this, right? It's like, no, shut everything down. We don't want all that technology. Um, so there's problems with this, right? There's problems with everything. So there could be a registration failure and your navigation, your robotic arm fails. It could be deviation. If there's a lot of soft tissue in some of our larger patients, it's, it may be hard to just, you know, find the right spot to put your frame or to move your instruments. Again, especially within training, we're just going to talk a little bit about it in, in a minute. You know, you have maybe two or maybe three people operating either simultaneously or doing other things at the same time, and somebody's going to bump the frame, bump the instrument, and then your registration is off. There is some skiving, especially with the robotic arms, so it's very easy to misplace this screw with the robotic, robotic arm if it goes in not the planet trajectory. And, you know, they could be, I think we all who have windows have seen this, right? Your, your PC crash and then everything goes down. And important to our, to our conversation today is over-relying on this, which is going to be a, a driving question for the, for the second part of the, of the talk. Cost, again, global, global spine, you know, even for... The U.S., you know, a, the fully developed and very wealthy nation, this is very expensive. So this is just the first part, right? It's just the imaging acquisition, right? Let's take, you know, the Siemens, the Metronic arm, you know, let's say half a million dollars, and then you need the navigation system, another half a million dollars, and then you're going to add robotics, which is 1.5 million. So you, you just from the get-go, you haven't placed your first screw. You're talking about, let's say, between 2 and $2.5 million dollars investment right so this is to me one of the bigger barriers in adopting all this technology the cost is so high that it's 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 very difficult to bring this technology physical space right not everybody has a hospital built in 2021 where you have massive rooms you know there's more and more people more and more equipment same thing here and we have older hospitals that the ors maybe not be as big and we bring in intra CT, robotics, two different reps from the companies, and all this stuff keeps adding big. You know, small issue, but it's still an issue. And I think most importantly is the traditional, again, as I mentioned, methods is still pretty good, right? So this is, again, comparing just from the lumbosacral spine, I show you the thoracic spine is not as good, but for the lumbosacral spine, you get a good mean from just the conventional fluoroscopy. Again, wider range, but still a pretty good mean. Of course, navigation is very high up, but this is still pretty good. You can see the raw numbers, 94% accuracy on the freehand technique and 99 on the OR. So what is our benchmark? What is, do we need to go to perfect? Do we need to go 100 or, or 94 is okay? A little bit of a middle breach is okay, as mentioned here, three millimeters. Um, and I think the key part as 
this technology is developing, we start researching more and more, is the intra-op and the post-op revisions, right? Because that will be the differential. If you're having zero intra-op revisions versus four, this is time. Again, still the same surgery, but it is time. This is my opinion on just this first part on enabled technologies in general. So as we mentioned, cost is a big one. So where is the cost benefit? So as this patient's having shorter stays because we're also adding MIS to the enabled technologies, or are we still doing the open exposures, but now we're using robotic? Is this, you know, is this patient having a shorter stay? Then it's you know a cost uh, saving measure. There's also a lot of disposables for surgery. You know, if we cannot recycle them or reuse them, then it's every surgery is going to be costlier just by using the technology, as besides acquiring the technology. So and then again, what, how long or how many procedures do you need to do before, let's say, you break even or your hospital break even in acquiring these technologies? We know some revision rates, shorter term, but we need to look at the revision much longer term. And is, is the construct or is the surgery done with enabled technologies is going to be the same as our traditional proven tested methods, or is it is going to be different? And I think one that I'm, I think I'm very interested to know is is there any platform that is better than the others or is it the technology? So it is this company better than this other company or is it just the robotics is better in general? So I think as, as far as I know, there's not many studies like that, of course, because I, I don't know many hospitals that have the three different robotics arms. That's like $10 million of equipment. But I think it will be very interesting to see if there's if one robotic arm or one navigation system is superior to the other one in terms of clinical arms. Mauricio, yeah. do you mind if I ask you a quick question? I'm yeah. sorry, it's just relevant right there. Um, so I, 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 I'm, this is, I've, I've been very interested in robotics as well, too, for a long time. So everything you're saying, you, you hit on a lot of good points. Um, I'm just curious, in your um, research, uh, have you encountered any uh, study that compared the time for conventional navigation versus a robot, let's say robotic uh, one level T lift versus a navigated conventional one level T lift, it's like the time it takes between each one of those modalities. Uh, yes, there are, and they're all like same hospital comparing like before they acquired the technology and after they acquired the technology. And on the top of my head, I remember the number of cases, but I think it was around 30 cases when it becomes like basically the teams know how to set up everything. And it becomes almost the same time as just your regular tilt. Uh, because, you know, as you bring the robotic arm and you, have, you probably use it, you have to attach it to the bed. And then at the, at the beginning, you may not have it draped all the way. And then people don't know how it works. So usually at the beginning of this, you know, having a robotic arm, your procedure is going to be longer. Usually between 30 minutes to 40 minutes from the, the paper that I know that compare that. But then again, around between, I think, 30 cases, then they become almost the same time as just like the regular telic time. Uh, interesting. I, I I would have to uh, maybe send that to me because I, I my experience with it is that is is counter that. I find that that uh, unless you're doing these cases very frequently, the staff that you have and you have the same staff coming in and in and in you know in and again and they're very comfortable with that robotic arm. You're, it's going to add a lot of time to your case. You're, you're talking about like. Many, 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 many more minutes at a time, you know? Um, so it, it's interesting. That's why that is the published one. <laughs> yeah, right. No, no, I know. I know. Um, the, 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 my, my one setback with, with the robotic technology is just the, is your staff. That, that's kind of like the thing that really inhibits you from uh, taking it to the next level because they tend to, you tend to have, in this day and age, it's hard to get a staff that's the same people you work with uh, day in and day out. And therefore, you're 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 committed to you know new new people you know every day and stuff like that. And what can happen is you know you have this new technology that ends up becoming a paperweight because nobody knows how to use it, or no one knows how to set it up, or it takes so long that you just kind of get frustrated. And you're like, all right, we're just going to do this with navigation. And then um and then see when you do that, then you kind of you know you're, now it's like your indications for using that robot are less and less and less and less. And so then. By the time you actually use it, you're using, okay, we'll use it for the most complicated case, but then nobody knows how to use it because you haven't used it for any of the simple cases. So it's a really, uh, you really have to like, you really have to dedicate yourself to this and be like, all right, I don't care. It's going to take much longer, but 
I want to do this for like a year so everybody gets comfortable so we can all be on board and we can get these, the timing of these cases a little bit down. But I've never found the robotics cases to be ever comparable to those navigation cases. I, I, I can't believe that's the case. I mean, there's so much more set up. There's so much more um, uh, trays. There's so much more that goes into those cases than a, like a standard navigation case, you know? Yeah, I, I can tell you, and this is not published, but I can tell you in our hospital, the way that, that we did it is basically for the first six months, we just have the same team all the time. Yeah, that's great. It's just, it was unbelievable. I couldn't believe that, you know, it was, it was Dr. Chua. Kudos to him. He was able to do that. <laughs> I don't know how he did it, but he did it. So basically we had three reps from the company, just one for the robotic arm and two just opening trays and, you know, all that from the get-go. And then, yes, at the beginning, as you said, the case were way longer, but with time, and actually, you know, the, the case time goes down. Um, but yeah, it was unheard of, of having the same, you know, team for those cases, but, you know, except anesthesia, but let's say the same scrap deck or a nurse. And of course the same. Yeah, of course. Of course. That that's, that's, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, no problem. That actually, uh, Mauricio, if I can get in just a quick word, uh, to uh, piggyback off what, uh, Jonathan just said, you know, that is an absolutely excellent point that, uh, we are all overlooking right now because we're focusing on cost and how effective it is, how safe it is, how can you bring it into your hospital? But there's no question that the current challenges and consistent and reliable staffing is, is going to impact how often we use this, how we, you know, how, whether we can commit to it or not, just for the reasons that Jonathan just said. Um, but I, but I, I think that, Mauricio is also right. It, it takes, um, you know, for better or for worse, it takes a surgeon champion to push this to say, you know what, I'm going to know it better than the, than the rep, than the staff, than the nurse. And, you know, what's not going to work, I think, these days is to bring in an expensive machine or robot without a plan, without a vision to commit to it 1000% for one year or two years or three years. If you're going to bring it in to trial it, okay, you convince the hospital to buy it and then let's just figure it out later. I think that's going to be a recipe for uh, really disaster. So yet another, um, yet another ingredient, if you will, or another aspect that is, that is going to confound what we all end up thinking about these technologies. Right. And so then, true, so true, Ali. Uh, and then, you know, you both basically are, are hitting a very, I want to not necessarily sensitive, but a very high topic, you know, again, in my particular case, in my residency that I, I'm going to talk about some of the pitfalls of this is you as a resident also, it's like, okay, nobody knows how to use this. We're not going to use this. We're going to go back to freehand, which I'll, I'll show you in a minute from kind of the real cases examples that, I, that I'm bringing. Um, but just kind of wrap this part up. This is not going to go away. Uh, you know, for those who like, Numbers. So this is, you know, the projected market in 2028, 4.5 billions. Um, the Asia Pacific region is the one fastest growing in robotics. This is just robotics. Um, and then you get publications like this, you know, why should my hospital buy next? You know, how do it, you know, guidelines to apply all this new technology so the hospital administrators are happy. And again, as we were talking, you need to have a plan, otherwise they're going to be very unhappy of, you know, spending all this money and, uh, and you're not using it. But I think, all in all, the patients are already asking about this, right? And, and for good or bad, it's also a marketing tool, right? You're doing, you know, robotic spine surgery um, and they'll ask for it. Just this quick thing, right? Google, robotic spine surgery, almost 10 million results. So this is something that, I, in my opinion, is not going to go away. And as we were already talking, we need to have good, clinical outcomes to show that it's actually a valuable tool for us. Okay, now like kind of the second part uh, of this is training, right? By kind of lumping residency and fellowship training, let's call it just training, right? Important part, right? There's a generational change. Um, and I'm a millennial, this will be gener generation Y, uh, but I can tell you most of Whoever is here in academics, most of your residents, most of my co-residents and fellows are in this later generation. As you can see, for us, a smartphone, a tablet is like second in nature. And for those born in 1995, which 
currently they're 27 years old, um, which is to me still surprising, even though I was born in the 80s. You know, the 1990s sounds like 10 years ago, but no, they're 27. So your PGY1, PGY2 may be born in 1995, 1996. Um, so for them, Google Glass clothes with technology is it's it's like nothing, right? It's part of it. So there's there's this generational change in our training as well that I think most of us, let's call it younger ones, are are used to technology in general. So I think that it will create a big impact just by being a, a younger generation. But again, where is the data, right? So this is just simple searches in PubMed, you know, enable technology, spawning and residency, eight results, enable technology and education, 18 results, right? But then you type robotic surgery and general surgery. I'm not talking about the gynecologist, the urologist, the thoracic surgeons, and you have 621 results. So currently what, what I think, and this is what I'm here now, is we need to look at the other specialties that have, in particular, robotics, right? Because to me, Laparoscopic surgery is MIS surgery in our field, so that's not necessarily an enabling technology, but robotics is a good comparison, right? The Vinci, who's been around since, the, since 2000, um, what have they learned? What are their mistakes, and how can we kind of anticipate that, first, right? So, for example, a, a survey in 2000 for the, the general surgery program directors, 14% were using robotics. 13 years later, 63% were using robotics. So, in 13 years, you can see is a big jump in the use. And then you look at the residents, right? And, and the darker one is the PGY1-2, and then the lighter one is PGY3 and above, who are usually the, the people, who, let's say, the senior resident will be using the robotic in general surgery. But the issue is here, right? So is either observation or assisting, but very few actually operate, right? So that's something to keep in mind. Again, this is from general surgery data who basically has the Vinci for at least 20 years. And this is where they at, right? They have an app. I, actually, there's several ones, but this is an app when you can do some of the app training, some of the skills at home, and then you go to a place when you actually train with the machine. So they have an app already. And, and where are we in our training for robotics, for navigation? So what do the residents are receiving, right? I just told you there's an app. Look at the numbers, right? The PG1, 1 to 2, 60% received zero, right? Zero training in, in robotics before getting to a case, right? Cadavers, not existent. Some one-on-one -on -one hands on training or self-directed, right? Those who are interested, maybe that younger generation is reading about it. So even though they've been doing this longer, let's say us in spine surgery, they haven't figured out yet, right? Because you cannot have 60% of your residents not having zero training before going to a, a robotic case. But I think this is, to me, where we need to be very, very careful in spine surgery. So I, I put it as hurting training, right? So this is a survey of residents. PGY1 and 2s and PGY3 and above. Again, the PGY3 and above are usually the ones operating the, the, the being chief robotic arm, right? So you think it's important? Yeah, they do think it's important, right? At least more than half, half things is important. But more importantly, do you think they interfere with the resident participation and learning in the surgical procedure? So if you look at the senior residents, 51% of them agree or strongly agree that it is interfering with their learning. So the robotic case, the robot, the, you know, the machine itself is interfering with the learning, right? And what about the not sure guys, you know, 30% guys and gals? So is it is it maybe they're also agreeing or is it more this stuff? So, but then this was 2015. So I was like, I bet you there's a new one, right? And there was, 2021. So what do you think about the Da Vinci on your training? Look at the senior residents, detrimental, black bar, more than 50%. The junior ones think is beneficial. Are we also seeing some somewhat a generational change or maybe the junior guys are underestimating or overestimating how much they're gonna do maybe next year when they're seniors or something like that. Um, and this is basically the same question as the last graph. The presence of the robotic surgery, is it hurting? Is it interfering, impeding your ability to learn the common general surgeries, right? General procedures, look at the senior residents. Yes, more than 60%. The junior guys, maybe more than 
Mauricio. Yes. I'm going to interject one more time because you're bringing up some very interesting points. Um, <clears throat> so I would say I would argue that the DaVinci is a very, very different robotic platform than the, you know, the uh, Mazer or the Excelsius GPS. W would you would you agree with that? I, I agree. Um, it, it, and also the the uh, the the history behind the DaVinci is a little bit different as well, too. Uh, you know, this was, you know, you had for a long time, people doing general surgery, you had these laparoscopic wizards. I mean, at some point in the mid nineties, late nineties, laparoscopic surgery was like, was literally the end all be all. And the people who are still doing open um, cholecystectomies, appendectomies were almost, uh, you know, they almost seemed like dinosaurs, like very old school. Then the, the company, I forget the name of the company that developed the Da Vinci robot, introduced this robot. And then they said, hey, look at this new way of doing your surgeries. And a lot of these laparoscopic guys who are very comfortable doing those surgeries suddenly had to learn how to do it, the Da Vinci robot. And at a certain point in your career, let's say these are like guys who are like maybe 10, 20 uh, years into their training, it, to, to all of a sudden switch to something so radically different can be very difficult. So a lot of these, this, and this is from my observation, a lot of these robotic surgeons had to learn how to use the robot, they were basically forced to learn how to use a robot because it became so ubiquitous in their, in their, um, in their uh, specialties, like urology, for example, right? It, it's so ubiquitous to use a robot. So if you're very comfortable doing laparoscopic and now everyone's doing a robot, you have to relearn a new skill set, and they, they became not very comfortable. And as a result, uh, the residents, you know, they're not comfortable enough teaching the residents how to use a robot because they themselves are not that comfortable using it. So you had this whole like generation of these residents coming through who basically just sat there watching. Like I remember in my general surgery rotations, like the chief resident would just sit there watching the attending do a robotic case. I, and I wondered to myself, I'm, hmm, this guy's gonna graduate in six months. Like, how is he? I've never seen him, never seen him use a robot. Like, what are they gonna do? I, I, I still don't know what the answer to that is. You know, <laughs> I guess they learn at some point, but um, but uh anyway, to the, so the, the, the robotics for spine surgery are, are basically like a navigational uh, robot. They just basically, uh, it's almost like the Rosa robot in, um, for like stereotactic EEG. It just basically, it's essentially the exact same concept except for the spine. And, um, you know, it just basically brings you to a uh, fixed trajectory where you can use a set of drill, you know, uh, electric drills to place instrumentation. But it is not really much more than that. And you can, you, the software, yeah, that's probably the most intriguing thing about it, more so than the actual robot itself, because, you know, they've come out with more sophisticated planning softwares. You can actually predict, like, what correction you're going to get. You can, they give you all the, the, the spinal pelvic parameters. So, you, you know, they say, okay, this patient has, like, a 40-degree uh, PIL mismatch. So you need to do, probably do, like, a PSO at L4, you know, and it can show you, like, okay, instead, if, you, instead of, if you do, like, two-level ALIF and T10 and pelvis, what, what kind of correction you expect there, right? All that predictive software is, is interesting. I think that's where really the power of this robot comes in. And I think um, what it can do is as good as a teaching tool uh, where you can, you know, for the, you know, for the longest time, uh, when, I was in, when I was in residency, which is not that long ago, um, th there was a lot of thought placed into the, these, uh, de these deformity cases, but not nearly to the point of like what you can get through a robot, because you can calculate all those angles and all those, um, all those uh, basically all, all the deformity angles that you need very quickly. Versus, you know, if you had to kind of do it by hand and figure it out, and usually the attendings just want to get through the case, so they don't really, uh, you know, they don't really sit down and really go over this stuff with you. You kind of have to learn it yourself. So, um, so that that's where the power is. Is the predictive is the software. That's that's where I see it getting better. Because right now, I mean, if you think about it, right what's what's really the benefit than just navigation i i i don't i just don't see it it's yeah it's great but you know you can do all the same things with navigation okay yeah you, if anything maybe you have a little bit more degrees of freedom because the robot fixes you in a, in a in a in a trajectory you can't you know really undo it and if it gets inaccurate at a certain point during the case ah uh, it's such a pain you know so uh you know it's a very it's a very very different thing and I, in terms of the quality of the education of, of resident education uh, I, I think it's, it's just a different skill set. I, I don't think it really um, will affect resident education very much, but I think what it does is it potentially creates this possibility of losing um, the, the, the anatomic knowledge that you have to develop in order to do this all freehand. 
because you should be comfortable doing if the if the this is just a tool. If this breaks, I wouldn't say you should cancel your case. You should keep going, unless it's some really crazy ahead of my next slide. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Sorry, but I don't want to see your thunder. I don't want to see your thunder. No, but um, I think it's just a totally different skill set. It shouldn't be like I I personally don't view it as being like detri detrimental to resident education. It's just like a supplements resident education versus the, the Da Vinci. I think it, it truly was de detrimental because it, it was like a totally different, totally different thing, you know? No, and again, I, I agree with it. There are different platforms, right? Um, yeah. as, as I showed, unfortunately, from our field in spine surgery, there's not much data. Uh, we right. Publish data that we have that we've been collecting. There's not much. So this is, again, it, on my end, very provocative, which is I, I achieved my goal because, <laughs> you know, from your yeah. comment, yeah, it's not the same platform. <laughs> But I, think, I would also yeah. argue that most of the papers that are, are published uh, are have pretty significant conf conflicts of interest uh, with uh, with robotics, as is the case with most of the papers in spine surgery. So it's like, at the best case scenario, it's like highly misleading. Not it's not it's not really useful information. It's just misleading information. So you, you argue whether it's even worth publishing at all. You know, like there's no way that. Uh, you know, the, the robotics takes the same amount of time as navigation. It, it's impossible. There's just, just, there's just no possible way. Right. So, I mean, maybe, I don't know, maybe they, they figured out some, some right. thing, but like Again, a lot of, all, you know, like the people who use a robot tend to be very pro robot. Right. So like the, the paper tends to be to come magically come out some way where it's like, Oh wow, the robot's the most amazing thing in the world. Right. But then when you actually use it, you're like, huh, it's not that great. <laughs> like what the heck, right, right. <laughs> you know? No, so, right. I, I, I think the data, so there's still like not much data out there and it doesn't make sense. It's very easy to design a study to be like, okay, how long does it take to do this? And how long does it take to do this? Do costs make sense? But I think that, that these things are in a way misleading because it's trying to argue in, in favor of using a robot from authors who have conflicts of interest. So I don't even know if these papers are even useful in any way, you know? Anyway. That's my two cents. Sorry to interrupt. You're you're doing a fantastic job. Again, this is this is this this part of the the presentation is where again we don't have data as a show. The PubMed searches that you have three results and then two of them are like not related. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. I had the same issue when I was I I, I published a review as well too. Uh, it, 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 same exact problems. Same exact problems. So. Um, this is actually unpublished data, but it's submitted. So we actually uh, surveyed uh, last year, um, you know, we sent to every program director, spine fellowship directors regarding the use of robotics. So these are the, the numbers that we have. So it, this is both uh, neurosurgery and orthopedics. So almost 80% believe that training in robotic surgery is important. This is only asking about training, right? 71% currently use or in the near future intend to use robotics. 44 believe that robotic training should occur during residency. I think this one is interesting. If it's not in residency, then robotics should part, be part of the fellowship. Um, the vast majority do not have a curriculum for robotics. Um, and 70% of, the, of their trainees have performed less than 25 robotic cases. So I think this is where we can learn, again, from their, the past experience from all the specialties and start early on in spine developing a curriculum. We talk about, yes, different platforms, but I think there's still a role for training and having a curriculum for all this new technology. And again, this is just specifically about robotics, but it would be the same with navigation, virtual reality, augmented reality. For example, this was this is me with one of the headsets recently. We, we did a simulated virtual case, and this is what I was able to see. And you can use this to grab the spine and then turn it around and then grab the C-arm and move it around. So, you know, this is actually very cool because then you can very easily see the spine, move it around, you feel you're in the OR and you're simulating a case. Could this be, again, this is, this part of the virtual reality is still very in its infancy. So can we go one step further? And as, as Dr. Rasul was mentioned, where we're we doing planning on the robotic platform, can we do surgeries and surgical planning in virtual reality as well? This is orthopedics. This is shoulder arthroplasty. So for residents who actually did virtual reality simulation of the surgery have higher scores when performing this surgery in cadavers versus the ones that only did their learning via a video. So again, as you can see, 18 participants, as with all the new technologies, you know, very few participants. But however, 
very interesting results, right? If you simulate your surgery in a virtual reality environment, is there a role that you could potentially that serve you better? So is again, is the role in virtual reality for training and augmented reality for actually doing the surgery? So real life cases, right? You already, you know, both of you, Dr. Barton, Dr. Sue already mentioned some of this, right? So this is real life. All this has happened in, in my hospital, right? So the navigation is not working, cancel the case. I was completely surprised, but has happened more than once. Hey, Trump, oh, that screw looks good. And then post-op, you have quite severe medial breach, right? We're using navigation, but that's what happens. So I, usually the resident, right, bump the array. So then you have to do a second, a third CT spin with the arm, the arrow. And then are we looking at how much radiation is the patient getting? How many you know, times have you do it? Again, if you do it multiple, how many CT scans do you do? And one that we were talking about, um, you know, your team. Oh, sorry, this x-ray tech doesn't know how to use the arm or the arrow. Then that said, you cannot do intra-op CT, and then you cannot use either navigation or you cannot use the robotic arm. Or one, the more common one, I think, at least in our hospital, because we're short staff everywhere. Oh, sorry, all the techs are busy, or sorry, the tech is in another room, cannot come. So how long do you want to wait and sit and do that? Or just say, you know what, let's just do it open, right? So this is all kind of pitfalls, barriers to incorporating this technology as well as training, because it's very easy to say, you know what, forget about navigation, forget about robotics, we're just gonna do it open, you know, I'll, I'll do the floor, I know how to manage, I found there's a panel, and then we're just gonna do it that way. But again, despite the general surgery and the Da Vinci, this is GI surgery, more than 20 years of the robotic platform, to this day, right, 2020, and they have a task force within their, their society. Their curriculum and their training for the residents and fellows to this day are inconsistent. Again, this is why I think we as you know, spine surgery field can learn from their mistakes and then early on develop good curriculums, good training programs for all enabled technologies. Again, the comparison is easy for robotics, even though, again, it's not the same platform but it's the easier comparison to see where, where do they fail. So we, we hopefully don't do the same uh, mistakes. So then the question is, how do we incorporate it safely? So again, this is mostly opinion. I think some of you may share the same opinions. I think we need to define some benchmarks. So what are the expectations for a pedicle screw? Do you need to be perfectly within the pedicle or are we okay with less than two, three millimeters of medial breach or lateral breach? And then, which is to this day, quote unquote, the standard or the gold standard for pedicle screw uh, placement? Is it freehand? Is it fluoroscopy based? And I think from there, that's where we build for the, the newer technologies, right? What is that solid foundation that we need as, as trainees, residents, fellows to then incorporate these new technologies? And I, again, I, you know, as far as I know from, let's say, basically today, <laughs> There's nothing out there. Uh, we're trying to develop a curriculum, but there's nothing out there yet. And then the solid foundation, what does it include? Of course, anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. The typical, and this is, I think, is valid for nursery, orthopedics. Your, your oral board question is like, oh, I want to use navigation for this. Okay, you know, there's no navigation in your hospital, or the tech is not here, or whatever. How are you going to do it? So, again, anatomy is all the basis of our specialty, surgical specialty. So, you should be able to. Be able to localize the pedicle with a hook or with a pentacle four, and then be able to place a screw freehand or something like that. To me personally, I think that's the benchmark. And I can tell you just by comparing, you know, within my residency, there's there's a wide gap of knowledge just in the anatomical landmarks in spine. So, and again, at the end of the day, it's all about patience, right? So, how do we incorporate all these technologies? How do we train? in these technologies, but how we keep it safe, right? We cannot be, for example, like this one, right? Doing tra medial trajectories where, you know, this is a thoracic screw, right? Again, real case. Spinal cord is right here. I, you know, are, are we okay training this way? This was actually a freehand case, right? But then you can see the replacement screw is actually out of the pedicle. Again, within thoracic spine, we're okay because, you know, we have bone and bone, but is it is it acceptable to do this way? Are we looking at Again, virtual reality, cadavers, models. I think, you know, even without the new technology, there's still a lot of 
gaps in our knowledge about how to train uh, spine surgeons. And then again, more provocative is, you know, I still have them. These are mine. You know, the the Benzel Biomechanics Spine Stabilization. This is the first edition, very small. This is the big one, right? We I still have them. You have actual books, but now people are reading in their iPad, the Kindle. But then when you're preparing for a case, now you're not going to read anymore. You're going to go then to the virtual reality. I know some residencies will pay for your books. Are they going to now pay, you know, $300 to get you like a virtual reality setup so you can then prep for the cases and train in, in your home with the, with the headset? Is that where you're going to look in 2023 or 2025? So again, some final takes, as, as I mentioned, enable technologies, I don't think they're going to go anywhere. They're going to continue an uptrend in adoption everywhere. Uh, my view is navigation will become the standard of care for pedicle screen instrumentation. And one thing that I always like to say is, at least within neurosurgery, we, no matter where you go, you can do spine surgery, right? If you're a vascular surgeon, you can still do spine surgery. So for those people, it may be easier to have those navigation that for those of us who are passionate about the anatomy of the spine, who like to do freehand, let's say. So that could become like a standard of care. You have to use at least navigation to place your instrumentation. Navigation, let's say indications continue to expand. Some people are already publishing and using for localized spine tumors, extra intradural bony tumors. Now we see a lot of new things about single position surgery that, again, you can do it for fluoroscopy, but it's probably way easier to do it with navigation. And reports of 100% navigated case, no x-ray needed, maybe just the final one, right? Um, as Dr. Rizzo was already mentioned, I also think that the software and the AI part of the robotics is just going to change a lot, right? You're going to do pre planning and then the software is going to learn. And then you're going to know that if you have this mismatch of this amount of um, whatever parameter, uh, lumbosacral parameter you want, the robotic will know, like, okay, listen, from your prior 100 case plus the other 100 case that somebody did it other work that we have it here, you need to do a PSO. You need to do an SPO. And there are already some trials, I know, in cadavers and in some of the platforms to, let's say, attach a drill to the robotic arm, and then it will perform the actual amnectomy. So this will be more similar to a Da Vinci-like platform and not just like basically a steady arm for a product screw. And then I think VR is going to become the training platform for most of the, the younger residents. That's it. So enabling technologies continue to evolve and you know have high use in spine surgery. Uh, applications that will continue to grow, they are growing, and more people are adopting every day. We see it on social media, we're talking in, in conference and meetings, and of course the companies have a lot of stake in that as well. Um, but I think that the tricky part is the incorporation of the training programs, right? And I think this is where platforms aside, I think we should take the prior experience from the other fields and then try to anticipate the things that we're going to need so we don't end up in the same things and we can incorporate this safely. And again, within spine surgery, enable technology or no, we need benchmarks. We need minimums. What do you need to know as a spine surgeon or as a general neurosurgeon before you go to either more complex cases or enable technologies? That's it. Awesome talk, Mauricio. Thank you, Thank you mate. That was awesome. Hey, it's Mike here. Sorry, Jay. You there? Yeah. Hey, can I um can I just say something? I can tell that Mauricio is a young man because uh, he's enthusiastic about robotics. And uh, you know, this is uh, you know, as a young surgeon, right? I think it's really good to be enthusiastic about tech. I am certainly not anti-tech. Um, I reckon the biggest point for me that you um uh were um uh, sort of we were glossed over a little there is actually on ergonomics with both navigation and robotics and I, i've been doing this a little while now and after you know thousands if not tens of thousands of freehand pedicle screws the ability to use power tools with more confidence which comes with navigation uh, and robotics is a huge game changer for me i mean i'm you know i've been out 12 years now and uh, my wrist is gone like, uh, and so it's going to prolong my career. This is what I see. Um, second thing is that we're getting better at doing this without radiation. 
And so, yes, yeah, for sure, that's a big concern, right? But there are new technologies out there with NAV that can be potentially combined with robotics in the future that actually are light-based recognition. So you don't even need to get an intra-op CT. You've got a technique, a technology out there. I don't know if you've seen a 7D navigation, no conflict, they don't pay me. But, you know, you get a, uh, um, a, a, a flash of light in the OR that marries that up with a pre-op CT. So the, the light recognizes bone. It's an operating light connected to a big screen. I'll put up some, uh, for those that haven't seen it, I should put up some pics. Uh, but it's just brilliant technology, right? So this is where we're going. The final piece of that is that you may not even have to CT patients. You can get a bone recognition MRI and actually feed that into the system. So suddenly you've got essentially radiation-free navigation that can then be applied to robotics. Um, the only other thing I'll say, you know, I'm quite passionate about this as well. I gave a similar talk to our Smart Society of Australia, except it wasn't as good as yours, so I'm going to borrow yours next time. But uh, <laughs> um, uh, the other thing I'll say is that the um, uh, uh, we are not where they are with the Da Vinci, right? Yeah, I don't know what the others think, but the, the Da Vinci is allowing um, those say, prostatic surgeons to get, yeah, to get in a really, really tight space. Our, our robot, these robots were... Uh... You know, the, the, the issue, you know, these robots are not nothing new. I, I, Mike, I agree with you 100%. I used to be very, very pro. I was, you know, like uh, these robots, I was very excited about them. And um, I, I have a much more jaded take, much more cynical take after getting on practice and, um, and using them. The, these were robots when they, they spent, basically these companies spent way too much in R&D. They took too long to develop and they realized they just need to get them out and make some money back on their investment. And they were rushed to market. The original the renaissance and the original version of the like the initial robots that came out were clunky they were very unsophisticated they were very difficult to use nobody liked them they, it, they took forever to adopt and now finally maybe five ten years later the software got a little better and it's a little bit you know yeah it's they're a little bit better but there, there's no there's no no one there is no mass adoption of these um, any, anywhere to the level of where I would say the Da Vinci. Da Vinci is like ubiquitous, you know, it's or, or in like ob and in urology. Like you, you don't even hear of a surgeon who's never, uh, who's not robotic trained over there, right? But here it hasn't really taken off. And I think until they get to the point where you have a robot that can just kind of, you know, autonomously place an instrumentation, you just pre press a button and it scans the patient, places all the screws, you know, by itself. I don't, I don't. I don't really see this taking off very much. I. I, I think I. I agree. I agree more with you, Mike. What we're going to see is um, CT-less nav, the seven D. That. That. I think that's that has more potential. I think. Um, uh, uh, basically, you know, looking at more, uh, kind of maximizing the seven D is is going to be the way. G getting less uh, scans intraoperatively. Uh, being you can just kind of. Uh, you know, expose the anatomy to get a get a registration shot with with a device, marry it just like you said to a preoperative imaging, and just and just go from there. I think right now that's going to be where the hot spot is, and until the robots kind of get to the next level of being more autonomous and a little bit, I guess, quote unquote, smarter. Um, I I just don't see mass adaptation of it. I agree with you, Mike. No, I, I again, I think this this is great and. That was my goal with putting those slides up there. You know, you are in academic programs and training programs and you're using the technology. I'm using it as well as a resident. So again, it's we're not at the level of Da Vinci, but I do think it is relevant to get where they failed as in, as a training idea, right? As, as a training curriculum, you know, all of that. Totally with you, Marisa. Yeah, totally. I, I think it's, it's just going to be a... a uh, another tool in our armamentarium. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mauricio, may uh, I ask the you? Next, the next um, Oh, yeah, Alex. Yeah. Hello. Mauricio, may I ask you? Um, you um, mentioned that um, the, um, the training effect for the residents uh, is uh, astonishing high if they perform virtually shoulder um, um, replacement surgeries virtually before. Um, what is your um, opinion in robotics? Uh, when you see yourself now and in five years, uh, will you be a, a robotic um, surgeon? Will you use it or what, what is your point of view now, um, and it's, maybe it's interesting to see this video in YouTube in five years, 
Um, but what do you think? Is it um, worth investing time for you? I, I, I can tell you that I'm, I'm very in, in agreement with Dr. Rasuli and Dr. Salvi. I, I, I think right now robotics is not near at the Vinci. So my take, let's say, you know, I'm, I'm looking for a job and looking at my career and what I want to do is I'm not going to request a robotic arm, right? Because I currently, I personally don't see the value, right? I've used it in, you know, not thousands of cases, but at least, you know, 20, 30 cases. And it's like, oh, it's fun. It's great. Everybody loves it. Anesthesia goes always like, oh, what are you guys doing? You know, but it's like, we could do this with just the navigation, right? And it, to me, at this point, is like, it doesn't add much. Um, I think virtual reality, which I think is part of your question, I think it's going to be key. Um, what I would like to see is, you know, residents training in that. And then again, and hopefully, you know, you get access to that. You can actually grab the spine in the virtual reality, spinning around and do all that. And it's like, yeah, it's the same like a spine model, but then you can actually grab a, a pedicle probe and then put a pedicle screw virtual. So I think it helps because not everybody, I personally, it took me a while to figure out the anatomy of the spine. So I think virtual reality will help. But of course, we still have like models, uh, but I think that will help as in you need to complete some of these cases virtually before, you know, let's say, I'm going to let you do it. Let's say if I'm the attending, I'll be like, I'll let you do it because, you know, I think you've completed it. I'm not going to go anywhere, but I, I think it's, it's, it's a good way of, of getting there. Yeah. And I think it's very important. My first VR glasses I've used, it was like 15 years ago. It was like bad vector graphics. It was like uh, using the Atari in the 80s. Um, but now if you use virtual reality, it is astonishing good um, what do you see? This is brilliant surface. This is rendering. It's really looking like real, but it's virtual. And it is, I can recommend any, any surgeon to once use these VR glasses on any Congress, because you will think this is, well, you have never seen this before. Um, but I just want to mention the Da Vinci um, robot was not um, um, developed with the same purpose like the robots and we use in spine surgery. Um, I think it was the US Defense uh, Ministry as well. Uh, they were looking for a solution uh, where they can help soldiers in the crisis in the field without having a, a surgeon there. The robot should operate the, the soldier, the wounded soldier, and the surgeon is somewhere else in the center. And this was the purpose of developing Da Vinci. So the surgeon is not sterile in the field at the OR table. He is somewhere else in the center and he's helping. So my my um, my vision of a good robot is that Mike Salby is helping me here in Switzerland while he is in Australia. And he helps me when I say, oh, I'm, I'm, I messed it up, please, uh, Mike, log in, and you can use this uh, new Spinal Da Vinci and help me. And I think we will, we will get to this point. And, and I, can, uh, I can just say I'm in, into robotics. Um, I will start it um, because um, this is a traditional technology. It's not the best. It's not the best possible. Um, but when we take this robotics um, technology now, we are able to get to the next step, maybe a spinal Da Vinci system or something like this. And like in navigation, I, I use navigation since, since years, and I'm so glad that the step to robotics is really not, not, not difficult, you know, because if you're navigating, you can do robotics as well. This is my experience now. And so I, I think we need this robotic system now, maybe not everybody can afford, not every hospital, um, but we, we should go for robotics as well, even if you don't see the big benefit. I agree. I, I think it's <clears throat> it, everyone's pro robotics until you're uh, stuck waiting five hour turnover while they're cleaning trays and it's getting late and, <laughs> and you just want to get the case started, you know. It's the and same with know what's going it's on. I, I can't stress enough how how everything is. Are, you know, this is. Um, you know, that was interesting. I, I'm I'm bringing that up. You know, uh, the difference between strongest link and weakest link, right? This is clearly a weakest link type of thing because you can only be as good as in these cases as your uh, as your staff really, who are like setting up everything. And as soon as you know that magical hour of two and three p.m. hits, just like Dr. Burchuk said you're done. If you're doing that robotic case, oh my God, <laughs> that is a very, there's so many challenges that you don't, 
uh, expect that all of a sudden manifests right around that time in, in the ORs, you know? So, um, you know, it just, it just needs more time, I think. It needs a little um, bit more time, yeah. a little bit yeah. more version. Yeah. Anyway, um, okay, that was a great talk. Marisa, that was a fantastic uh, presentation, man. Great, great, great job. Thank you. Um, very, you hit all the right things. It, it, was, it was just absolutely fantastic. Very, very nice, very high level, sophisticated talk. Um, I would say, so next week, we have our uh, very own Dr. Mamagani speaking about spinal classifications. This is nice because I'm a very big stickler on these and nomenclature and everything. So I'll be very willing and ready to, to debate you, Alex. <laughs> Uh, and we will classify the session in the end. <laughs> yes, yes. Very good. Very good. <laughs> All right, everybody. Have a great week. Take care. Have a good weekend. And we'll see you next week. Thank you, Mauricio. It was great. Fantastic.